When should you reach for TEE perioperatively? What does the evidence say? Let's talk about when and why TEE is a game changer in perioperative care. Welcome to the second episode of Tea Time, where we talk about when to use TEE perioperatively. I'm your host, Dr. Plakis. Let's jump in. The clinical question today is, in which perioperative clinical scenarios could the use of TEE offer benefit to our patients? So how could TEE help perioperatively? We went over this last episode, but as a reminder, TEE can help evaluate cardiac surgery success, detect complications, help with hemodynamic management. In certain procedures, especially structural heart procedures, there's active procedural guidance. And it also helps in perioperative settings where TE is either inadequate or unacceptable depending on anatomical or mechanical or diagnostic features. There's four main areas where we see the benefits of TEE. That's cardiac surgery, non-cardiac surgery, interventional cardiology and EP, and the critical care setting. Most of the main evidence today for indications for perioperative TEE come from two major sources. One, the ASA SCA 2010 practice guidelines, and then also the 2013 ASC guidelines for performing comprehensive TEE examination. Now, let's go over all the levels of evidence that we see here. Just kidding. I told you, my goal for this podcast is to be very high yield and clinically relevant. The only levels of evidence that truly apply here are category B levels two and three, which basically tells us that most of the recommendations and evidence for TEE in the perioperative period come from observational studies and case reports, not large randomized control trials. The first category we can talk about is TEE in cardiac surgery. Looking at cardiac surgery and these two sets of guidelines, you'll see in the 2010 guidelines, TEE is recommended for all open heart and thoracic aorta surgeries. Open heart is defined as valvular surgeries. The points of benefit are listed such as confirming the preoperative diagnosis, detecting new or suspected pathology, adjusting surgical or anesthetic plans, and assessing for surgical success. It also says to consider TEE in high-risk cabbage cases, and we'll touch on that more. In the 2013 ASC guidelines, the same recommendations for open heart and thoracic aorta procedures are present, and the language is in some cabbage surgeries to consider it. There is a major paper from the Journal of American College of Cardiology in 2021 that was a retrospective analysis over a multi-year period, over a million patients at over a thousand centers performing isolated cabbage procedures both with and without TEE. The key findings for these were that intraoperative TEE globally tended to lower mortality across different STS risk groups. However, the benefit was most seen in high-risk cabbage patients, and it was very minimal difference in low-risk cabbage patients. Another interesting finding was that the use of TEE was associated with more unplanned valve procedures, and that makes sense because if you don't look, you don't know. The clinical impact here is that the evidence supports the use of TEE in high-risk cabbage patients where we don't see as great a difference in low-risk patients. A couple things regarding elective cardiac surgery is that TEE can be used to confirm preoperative findings, exclude additional pathology that may especially alter the surgical plan. Now, some of these key features are a persistent left SVC that may change your cardioplegia administration strategy. Detection of a PFO that may change you to a bicaval venous cannulation strategy, especially if repair is indicated, and severe aortic atherosclerosis that may prompt reevaluation of the aortic cannulation and cross clamp site or administration of certain mechanical support like an intra aortic balloon pump insertion. I also talk about emergent cardiac surgery settings where TE can be used when you don't have as much information to confirm suspected diagnoses like aortic dissection, cardiac tamponade, and define the extent of complications related to hemodynamic instability. Also in the setting of endocarditis, it's incredibly valuable for assessing valvular and perivalvular complications such as aortic root abscess, intracardiac fistulas, prosthetic valve dehiscence, and then in open chamber surgery as well, using it for de-airing, evaluating the success of procedures and detecting complications like we already went over. In the setting of the cath lab or EP lab, there's certain recommendations as well for when we should use TEE. Some of these indications include when the patient's under general anesthesia and ice ultrasound is not used. For specific procedures that are indicated, it includes septal defect closures, left atrial appendage occlusions, percutaneous valve replacement and repair, 
And there's not a whole lot different from the 2013 ASC guidelines on this. There's also evidence for non-cardiac surgery and the use of TEE. Some of these guidelines in non-cardiac surgery are more vague, such as if the nature of the unplanned surgery or the patient's known or suspected cardiovascular pathology might result in hemodynamic, pulmonary, or neurologic compromise. Basically, it says, if I think the patient might do really poorly, use TEE. And then if there's any unexplained, life-threatening circulatory instability that persists despite corrective measures, this is where rescue echo comes into play. And we'll touch a little bit more on this in a few moments. ASC guidelines are even more vague where it says if the patient has known or suspected cardiovascular pathology that may impact outcomes. What I take from this is use your clinical judgment. If you think the patient is high risk and the information you gain from TE could help you in their management, it may be indicated. I really like this table because it lists a lot of the different scenarios where TE is used in non-cardiac surgery. Just to name a few, in neurosurgery to help detect venous air embolism or rule out PFOs in sitting craniotomies, in liver transplantation surgery when you have severe hemodynamic instability, orthopedic surgeries, especially if your patient is high risk for pulmonary emboli, vascular surgeries where you're having cross clamps put on the aorta, and then other major surgeries where you may detect myocardial ischemia, tamponade, embolic events. There's a lot of different non-cardiac surgeries where TE can be used. The final category we'll talk about is the critical care setting. In the critical care setting, there's a specific recommendation and a vague recommendation. The specific one is if you have unexplained persistent hypotension or hypoxemia. The vague recommendation is if you need to evaluate the heart and you can't obtain the information you need with TTE and this information would alter your management, then TEE is indicated. A quick note on cardiac arrest. In addition to always asking for people, monitors, the code cart, there's two things I will always ask for in every cardiac arrest. One is echo, two are point of care ABG and labs, if either of those are available. And I will always ask for TEE if logistically feasible. I find that TE is far quicker at giving me a definitive diagnosis, and it's much easier when chest compressions are happening than trying to attempt TTE and possibly not getting adequate views of the heart. This has served me very well in diagnosing intraoperative pulmonary emboli, severe tamponade, severe vasoplegic shock. Let's touch on TEE versus TTE and when you might choose one or the other. The vague recommendation is when echocardiographic findings may alter your management and TTE is non-diagnostic or unlikely to be diagnostic. You can also look at cardiac anatomic considerations. What's better for evaluating the left atrial appendage or aorta where TEE is far better at evaluating those structures. In valve assessment, when you're looking at prosthetic heart valves or paravalvular abscesses, especially in moderate to high risk endocarditis cases, and then one other important consideration is patient mechanical factors. When they're on ventilators, if they have chest wall injuries, if they have a certain body habitus that makes it hard to get transthoracic views. If you remember nothing else from this presentation, this is a slide I want you to remember. This is the one I want you to screenshot and to refer to. It's the summary of when we use TEE and all its indications. So one, for diagnostic purposes, it's recommended to use TTE when able, but if unable due to mechanical or anatomic factors, or you suspect it to be insufficient, such as an endocarditis or prosthetic valve evaluation, use TEE. Number two, in cardiac surgery settings, we use it for open heart, thoracic aorta, and consider in cabbage patients, especially if they're high risk. Number three, in interventional cardiology or EP settings for ASD closures, PFO closures, left atrial appendage occlusions, valve repair or replacements, or even when a patient's under general anesthesia and we're not using ice catheters. Number four, in non-cardiac surgery settings where we have known or suspected cardiovascular pathology that may affect our outcomes, or we have unexplained hypotension. Number five, in the critical care setting, when we have unexplained persistent hypotension or hypoxemia, and also when TTE is not an option for various reasons, and this echocardiographic info is believed to alter management. And the last one, in ACLS settings, TE can be a great, great rescue tool. We've talked all about when to use TEE perioperatively today. Our next episode is going to be when not to use TEE. What are the safety issues surrounding that? Thank you guys for watching. If you want more of this content, hit the subscribe or follow button, leave a comment. We'll see you guys next time.